and then we start the next round. Now we are heading into the watch your back phase where we're going to be starting to potentially spawn the devastators. So let's go ahead and draw an event card. Scan area. So basically you scan, each player can choose one character, draw two items from the pouch and place them anywhere within short range of that character. All right, so basically two free items. All right, so I'm gonna draw two here. Hand axe and a gun that shoots three. That's pretty good actually. I'll go ahead and set it next to him. It's ammo and more armor. So I'm just gonna stick it right here. So that is the hostility phase. We're gonna go on to the trader phase. All right, so first Renton is going to activate and let's see what the bat. This is worth nothing, so he's gonna drop that and he's gonna pick up these two items that I laid down right next to him uh, because even though he already has a vest, he'll be able to sell that when he gets back to the ship. He's going to actually take two shots at Ariana, and let's see if he's within short range. Barely, actually. He's gonna go ahead and use burst fire ability, which is uh, using another ammo peg in order to add a die. So his normal one, I'm gonna remove one, and since it's the first shot of the round, you add it here to the tracker, and then I'm gonna pull another one to burst fire. So rather than one die, I'm gonna roll two die. And she doesn't have cover. So one hit. She has no armor, so she's going to go ahead and take a hit point off. Uh, he's going to take a second shot for a second action. So he's going to um, burst. Again, he's going to spend two to burst fire. And again, does one point of damage. And that removes a peg from her. So Ariana's gonna activate, even though she just got hit twice, she's gonna go ahead and search what's in here and see if there's anything good. Oh, check this out. She's gonna pick up a grenade. Now what she's gonna do with her second action is she's pissed because Renton took a shot at her. So she's actually gonna throw this grenade. Uh, which is going to be awesome. Now how area of effect weapons work, if you look here, five is, um, she's going to have to roll to see if she hits, but she's going to roll five dice, which is amazing, um, where she centered the uh, throw, and then everyone that's an inch away, you roll three dice, and then two inches away, you roll one dice. And they're clustered together here, um, so she's going to go ahead and huck it at Renton. Um, so let's see if she's able to hit there. Also, we know that this is reliable. So any of uh, these hazard dice, uh, double hazard dice that we throw has no effect on it, which is awesome. All thrown weapons or grenades are going to be at short range. If it's medium or long, it's going to have an M or an L next to it. So this is just short range. So Ariana would love to throw it right in between these guys, but because it has to be within short range, um, oh, you know what she's going to do? She's going to use her effortless action and actually move forward one inch, which will enable her to center it be right between uh, these two characters. So she's going to go ahead and do that. And how you resolve um, blast weapons or thrown weapons is you roll the blue die first. And sh she got a success. So any number of hits, you have hit your target. Uh, if I would have rolled a blank or no hits, then you miss, and so you uh, move the center of the blast one inch away from the target, and you get to choose. If I would have rolled a hazard, then it's a serious miss, and the origin of the blast is two inches away, and the target player gets to choose where it goes. So obviously he's going to put it as far away from himself as possible. But in this case, she does hit, so this is going to be devastating, a five die roll on both of them. So let's go ahead and roll first for Renton. Oh, three dice. Um, he has armor, so one of them will be absorbed. So he's gonna take two points of damage from that blast. And then let's roll for Lars. 
uh, three for him as well. He also has a point of armor, so he too is going to take two points. Actually, that was less devastating than I thought it was going to be. They're going to head back to their ship because they pretty much uh, got what they wanted. So Lars is going to do a double move. Uh, eight, which is out here. And then he will use his effortless action to move one more inch. Uh, and so that's Lars. Roy Kirk, he's going to go ahead and with his effortless action, he's going to grab... I don't know if he can grab both of these. I, I think you're limited to grabbing one item with your effortless action. So, oh, it's worth six. So he's definitely going to pick up this gun. Um, so Roy Kirk will leave that and we'll leave that hand axe and then move to try to get back to a ship. So he's going to move eight. So through the door and then he's going to end up right here. And then effortless action will move him one inch closer. So he's almost to the ship. And then Jace also is uh, going to head back. So he's going to double move. He'll go ahead and move out to here. And then effortless action one inch. Jack as well is going to be heading back. So he's going to move uh, eight inches as well. And I think he'll try to take a shortcut through here. So he's going to end up right here. Effortless action will put him on this side of the door. All right, so that is the activations. Let's go ahead and roll for the purge. Where's it? So first we roll for harvesters. There's none. Wow. And then the devastator. Let's go ahead and say that a devastator uh, did spawn. Well, let's say two of them spawned just to make it exciting, okay? Uh, because I want to show you the abilities of the devastators. Let's go ahead and roll where they spawn. So six and two. Six is right here and two is up here, which that one's pretty far away. They are going to activate. And the thing about Devastators is that they get two actions, uh, unlike the Harvesters, but they are linked actions. So that chain that's linking it there, that means that their action has to be the same. So they can either move twice or they can shoot twice. Uh, they're limited by those actions. And so uh, obviously because no one is within line of sight, they're going to move twice and move eight. Actually, this Devastator does have line of sight to Gak. But Gak does have a cover bonus. And so um, this Devastator is going to go ahead and shoot twice. If you notice on here, he rolls three dice. And so, pretty good shot, and Gak has no armor. So let's see what happens. He takes two hits. Uh, so, oh, actually, he does uh, effectively have one armor because he's in cover, so he'll only take one hit. And then the second shot, uh, one hit, which is taken... Uh, out by cover so no more hits so that is that devastator's turn and that devastator is just going to move since he doesn't have line of sight and he's actually going to target the closest one which is Ariana so he's going to move this direction I'll put him here so that's eight so that provides him a little bit of cover so that is the purge turn. We're going to do NPCs now. Kauri is going to attack, but doesn't have line of sight. I don't think she has really line of sight um, to Gak. Although she does have line of sight to Ariana. So let's look at her stats. And she rolls two dice. So she's going to roll two dice. And does two hits to Ariana. She has... Does she have cover at all? No, not really. So she's going to take two points of damage. Oh no, Ariana is down. Or not down yet, but only has one more hit point before she goes down. So that was her turn. Oh, Ganeki is here, just wandering around on his own. Um, he is going to try to join a crew, but there is no traitor within four inches. And so he's just going to move. And that means in order to go this direction four inches, he needs to move over here uh, to get over there. 
So that's his turn and assessment phase. We're going to go ahead and clear out everyone's tokens and start the next round. I actually think that's enough rounds for you guys to get a general feel of how the game plays. Uh, there are a couple of rules that we didn't get to, so let me mention one of them. Let's say Ariana here is shot and is down. So a defeated character basically isn't killed. They are unconscious and they need help. So you just put this token on there to show that they're not just prone but are knocked out. And the only way that you can revive a character is if you get a friendly character to apply a stim pack uh, or any kind of healing. And so uh, Gak does have a medi pack, so it would behoove him to go and make his way over there and has to be in contact with her to spend an effortless action to apply this uh, health pack. So it would heal her too, so she would take two more. Now she is revived prone, so she would have to spend an action during her turn to stand up. Uh, before she can move. If no one has a medipack, then you have the option of dragging a character. Your movement is halved to from four to two. So to take an action, you would only be able to drag her two inches. If you have another friendly character next to her and both of you are dragging, then you can go move your full four inches. And so you eventually want to make your way back to your ship where they can be revived. Otherwise, you have to leave them there. And when you get on your ship, uh, you take off. You probably lost them. You can have a mission to go back and try to rescue uh, knocked out characters. Also, another action we didn't see is to persuade. So NPCs can be persuaded to do certain things like trade an item to join your crew. Uh, or some kind of mission specific action and you take a look at their persuasion skill which is the P and so here Kauri has a persu persuasion skill of two and so let's say that Roy Kirk um, wanted to try to persuade her so you determine your your own persuasion skill by looking at the skill points and so Roy Kirk here has uh, two skills and that's his persuasion. Obviously you want to use your uh, captain who has four skill here because she would roll four dice but Roy Kirk here is going to try to persuade and so he's going to roll two dice and basically fails to persuade Kari because he needs to get a three or above in order to persuade her. Also reloading an item uh, all takes an action and so unless you have this gun ability, which allows you to reload using an effortless action, uh, you need to spend a whole action to reload once you run out of your ammo pegs. Uh, also, one of the things that we didn't do, and I should have done, is called a general search. So obviously use, use an action to search a crate, but you can also search the room that you're in. And once it's searched, you can put a, a search token, which is one of these, and just throw it in the room that was searched. Now, the limitation is that there can't be um, enemies in the room, and then once you do the search, you just take a random item from the token pouch. Also, one mistake that I made was um, you do need to use an action to put on or remove armor. So, uh, I might made a mistake that when I found the armor items, I just went ahead and put it on to the, you first actually have to place it into your item slot and then spend an action to actually put it on and then vice versa. Another important thing to say about effortless actions is that they cannot be made mid-action. So let's say for example um, he wanted to pick this up and so he has a four inch move so theoretically he could move all the way over here and in the middle of the move use an effortless action to pick up this item. You can't do that. I would have to move, use a move action to get in base contact with this, spend my effortless action, and if I wanted to move more, I would have to use a whole nother move action again. Also during the purge phase, the purge, when they spawn, will choose a target and will move towards that target uh, even if another target presents itself. So for example, let's say Roy Kirk is here. Um, the purge uh, only sees Gak, and so he's going to target Gak because he's within line of sight. But in the midst of his movement, obviously he's going to see Roy Kirk, and Roy Kirk is going to be closer. But because he's already chosen, he's not going to change his um, target 
mid move so he's going to continue and go after Gak. There is a good NPC AI chart that you can use and this is also on the quick reference card and it's really self-explanatory so this helps a lot know what the uh, NPCs are going to do. We also didn't talk about the N other NPCs like the Galactic Core who are functionally like the police or the security or the gangers and so uh, all of these characters can spawn and uh, interact with you and with the purge. Campaign is really at the heart of this game. I think it's the most fun rather than doing sort of one-off scenarios because you can advance and level up your characters. Once a scenario is finished, there is a post-game sequence as first extraction. And uh, in extraction phase, you decide what you're going to do with any people that you left behind. So for example, with Ariana, if she was knocked out, you can choose to do a rescue mission to try to get her back. You can also do what's called an emergency teleport, but there's a lot of bad things that can happen. So you are literally rolling the dice with what's going to happen. So if you roll a one, and this is the random white die. So in this circumstance, if I tried an extraction, I got a five, which is actually pretty good. The traders teleported safely, but their equipment did not survive the trip. Uh, so, uh, you know, if you roll a one, you die in transit or... Um, and a two, you actually will pull a different character. Uh, so uh, this is really iffy. If you're able to do it, you should do a rescue mission. Um, so there's other uh, options that you can have, but if you permanently lose a trader, uh, you need to spend your hard-earned money to hire more of them. Uh, next is the advancement phase, and you basically uh, get a career point. So here you would fill in the dot, and you would be able to fill in and upgrade any of your skills as well. You're also able to level up. Once you fill up a whole row, you will level up your character. And so when level one is complete, uh, you gain an additional health point and a skill point. Uh, and then once you fill up the second row, uh, you will level up to two um, and you get a further skill point. And then finally, when you fill the third level, you will get a health point, a skill point, and an additional action. So you can get a third action. Now Gak is unable to get a third action, so you're limited based on the number of dots that's available there. After the advancement phase is the trade phase, and this is where you can cash in. So just use the second number and total up all of the items that you want to cash in. And so I'm going to sell a lot of these and get the UA that I need. And then you can go to the trade posts and you choose one of these stores and look on page uh, 76 and 77 to see which one of these stores that you want to go to uh, because certain items are only available in certain stores. Also the sellback value uh, for some of these stores will be one UA more uh, than what it says if you're selling specific items uh, to these stores. So take a look at that. Uh, to see how you can maximize selling as well as purchasing items that you want. Like I mentioned before, on 78, it tells you how much it costs to hire a uh, crew, and you can choose to hire crew that you found that came with you, uh, possibly an NPC during mission. It's cheaper to do that, or a permanent hire, and you just randomly pick, uh, draw these cards, five of these cards, and, and they are available for hire. Or a temporary hire where they'll only be with you for one mission, for the next mission. Then you go on to the maintenance phase. And this is where you need to repair your ship. So every ship here has these stats. And you start out with the first three on all of these four uh, areas. And, the, and you roll to see what kind of degradation happens after each mission. So for example, here I'll roll. I got a two. So my propulsion here... Uh, is reduced by one. So you have to continuously be fixing your ship and it costs, in order to repair and fill in these uh, boxes, it costs two UA. And so you want to repair your ship so that all of these green boxes are fully filled up so that you have a fully functioning ship. Also some of the items that you can pick up are ship parts and this allows you to repair that many boxes for free. 
Once you fill in all of these boxes, then you can start upgrading these three potential items onto your ship. And those are scanners, airlock, auto defenses, and docking thrusters. And so you are not allowed though to upgrade these until you have fully uh, repaired the rest of your ship. There are advanced rules to this game and allowing for things like height, for jumping down, for uh, moving objects, using terrain, uh, jumping through windows, all of those kinds of things. Um, but I'm not going to go through the advanced rules. For example, repair actions, that's important. So I'll let you go ahead and read through that with the advanced rules. But for the most part, I think you got everything that you need in order to be able to play this game. So that's basically how you play. Hopefully this was helpful in giving you an idea of what the rules are and getting a sense of how the game plays. It does play relatively quickly. I was daunted by how thick this rule book was, but for the most part, uh, you're only reading the first half of the book. And different from other games, a lot of the fluff is towards the back where it talks about the different characters, the background of the characters, as well as the fluff of the world and what's going on with the purge and why they appear, uh, all that kinds of stuff, which I love reading. But uh, mostly the rules are at the beginning and um, and it isn't the most intuitive way that you can find rules, but uh, the game is simple enough that after a couple of games, I felt like I got most of the rules down pat and any of the things that I had to look up was here. As well, make sure you do print out these reference cards from Board Game Geek and give a thumbs up or some geek gold to the people who made these. I really like these a lot. And so they're super helpful in having a quick reference guide so that you're not flipping through the book trying to find the rules here. Also, I've painted up uh, two additional crews that you can use for uh, traders. And I eventually want to get the, the character boards so that we can play uh, up to four or five characters. I don't know if I would play a six player game at that point, if you guys are far enough apart, because I know in six player games, four to six player games, you use two mats. And I do have enough terrain. And if you want to see my review of Battle Systems Terrain, uh, go ahead and click here and you can see that review. And I have all intentions of using that with future games. Also, the scenarios that are in the book is for two player. But I do know that Battle Systems do have other scenarios. Go ahead and head on over to their website. Uh, to download those. Otherwise, I found this game to be really fun. I like how interactive it is where you have the option of either playing co-op or shooting each other. I will say that if you do play co-op, you might want to increase some of the difficulty of the purge because the game, the way that it's set up, assumes that there's going to be some fighting that's happening between players. If that's not happening, I think the purge are a little bit easy until you get further up on that track. Uh, one game that we played, um, I lost uh, two of my traders because two devastators appeared and I was sandwiched in between them and they were all getting uh, three dice shots at my traders and pretty much took out two of them in one round. And so the game does increase in difficulty based on your luck or bad luck as I had it. But for the most part, if you're playing co-op, which is totally doable with this game, you might want to consider increasing the number of purge that appear so that the difficulty goes up a little bit more. Other than that, I think this game is super fun, especially as a skirmish game. And honestly, it really reminded me a lot about the upcoming emphasis of Star Wars on the Outer Rim with the smugglers, um, with traders, all that kinds of stuff. I could see easily swapping in Star Wars miniatures and making this a game for the Outer Rim. Sort of your uh, skirmish, RPG-like advancement that happens. So there's a lot to this game I really like. The scenery is really awesome. Yes, there is some setup time that is required to put together all of these cardboard parts. But one of the great things is when you're finished, this can all go back into the box, which I really, really appreciate. And so this is a really fun game. I'll suggest it to you. I know it's going to be coming out in retail stores this fall. And so uh, go ahead and pre-order if you're able to. Or you can order directly from their website. I know that Battle Systems has the core game available for purchase now. So go ahead and get this game and have a lot of fun with it like I did. Subscribe to my channel and we will see you next time.